Today's guest on the podcast isn't a six-string guitar slinger, although he's in the possession of quite an impressive six-string bass. Bass player Nathan East is my guest as we talk about the legendary Eric Clapton MTV Unplugged album. Because I'm paying tribute to this album in theaters throughout Holland in the fall of 22 and 23, I'm trying to talk to as many people that were directly involved in the recording of the most legendary live album of all times. Earlier on, I've talked to Clapton's wingman, Andy Fairweather Lowe. And he comes to the solo and I go like that, and the harmonica flies out. And the amazing piano player, Chuck Lavelle. Hello, this is Eric Clapton calling from Hong Kong for Chuck Lavelle to see if he might be interested in playing some shows at the Royal Albert Hall. If you want to see those interviews, be sure to stick around till the end because I will link to the playlist with those interviews. Nathan East, man, I don't know where to start. This man has played in all the great records you know, played with all the great musicians you know, to name a few. Michael Jackson, Beyonce, Stevie Wonder, Eric Clapton, Pierre Gabriel, Whitney Houston, George Harrison, Ringo Starr, Phil Collins, Toto, Daft Punk, Herbie Hancock, and that's not even all of them. If you like the podcast, please consider hitting that like and subscribe button. It will help me out a lot. Okay, without any further ado, let's go. Mr. Nathan East, welcome to the podcast. Before we dive into the Eric Clapton Unplugged album, uh, people will most definitely know you as one of the most recorded bass players in pop history, but you are also a great songwriter. And in my humble opinion, you're the co-writer of one of the greatest songs ever written to open a radio show with. Um, I'm talking about Easy Lover. Can you tell me um, about the session when you wrote that song with Phil Collins and Philip Bailey? Oh man, you know, I love it when a song comes like that, you know, because it, literally we were almost finished with the album. We had recorded for about two weeks and uh, maybe second to the last day, Philip was expressing, he said, well, it'd be great to have something that could be an identifiable single, something the record company would go with right away, you know, and, and uh, I remember just going over to the PDA, to the piano at the Townhouse Studios and uh, sat down there and just kind of wrote the intro and just started kind of playing the chords and and then uh, they started kind of joining in singing and it literally in about 20 minutes the song was written, you know, mo most of the yes. musical part and, and, and the lyrics, you know, came the next day. Okay, the next day, so, but also very quick. Very quick, yeah. I mean, it's amazing yeah. when it happens like that, and to to see, you know, the way it's received. You know, that's that's uh, you couldn't wish for more. And was was Phil Collins also like the the link with meeting Eric Clapton? He was. He introduced me to Eric while we were doing those sessions. We went out to Guildford, out about an hour outside of London, and, uh, and he introduced me to Eric at a pub down the street from Eric's house. And uh, you've been playing with him ever since. Man, it's amazing. You know, we're, this is like the 40th year that we've been working together, which is, uh, wow. it's unbelievable. 40th year, I'm, I'm, I'm 43. And it's like <laughs> mind boggling. <laughs> yeah. 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 I asked you um, on the podcast to talk about the legendary Unplugged album, the years leading up to the Unplugged album. It was a, I, th I think it was a special time, right? Especially for Eric. Yeah, a very special time. I mean, funny, in, in, in all the 40 years, it's, it's been very special. You know, I remember the first time we we worked with Eric in the studio on the Behind the Sun album, you know, and, and so he was meeting kind of all of us for the first time. We were meeting him, you know, kind of working together. There's Jeff Picaro and Steve Lukather and all these great music, musicians, uh, great filling games and we were all like like little kids you know <laughs> meeting, yeah. meeting one of our heroes and uh we uh, you know we basically just it was it was uh, mutual respect and uh, kind of love at first sight yeah and leading up to the, the unplugged show what can you remember and what about your thoughts on doing that show because at that time um early 92 unplugged was like starting to become a big thing on on mtv what did you think about doing that show was it like a big deal back then or was it just a gig no it was it was it was a pretty kind of breakthrough moment first of all you know nobody had ever just unplugged everything you know especially in in an electric band you know so yeah um, to play acoustically ended up being a um something kind of like we're looking up and saying yeah who does this you know so we we didn't really know but but it was literally acoustic that nothing was plugged in and and um 
and so uh you know the, the bass i use is, is behind me there you know and oh, yeah the acoustic bass here and the upright are, are instruments that i used for the for the uh, actual show i uh i remember the 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 the, the circus recording which I first heard on the, the deluxe um, version of Unplugged. Oh. I was like, wow, what is that? Is that a guitar or is that... It almost, the, 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 the guild bass you, you used, right. it almost sounds like a, an acoustic guitar lead sound, you know? It's, it's yeah. amazing playing and amazing sound. Yeah, no, it's, it, it, was, uh, it, was, it was all very... Spe- I mean, I, I feel so fortunate because all these special moments have come, you know, where... They're not so planned, but then next thing you know, they they become uh, sort of historic, you know. And then that was yeah. uh, certainly uh, one of the projects. I mean, it only took an afternoon to make like a few hours, and um, you know, to turn around and sell like maybe almost thirty million albums was just incredible. Yeah. Just to see the response that that the world had to this this little project that we just went out to Brace Studios outside of London. And did an afternoon of acoustic playing, you know, to yeah. um, to have that kind of impact uh, also lets me know too that you don't have to you don't have to hit anybody over the head with your ideas and your music, you know. It doesn't have to be piercing. They say if you want to get someone's attention, whisper, you know. So, so this was sort of you know acoustically played and 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 uh, a very you know more gentle approach to uh, a record that you know, just uh, sold so many copies and, and seemed to have touched so many people emotionally. Yeah. And, and why do you think like this, this particular sound at that moment in time and, and the, the song choice, is that also like of influence on, on like the end result of selling almost 30 million albums? Yeah, I think it's a combination of a lot of things. You know, one of the very first, I think it may have been one of the very first unplugs that was going mm, yeah. on, you know, and MTV was uh, was kind of just really getting uh, rolling really good. And, and so you had now you had a visual audience um, and then the combination of songs, the, the sort of the sentiment. And then of course, you know, the, the tribute to uh, Connor with Tears in Heaven. Hmm. Yeah, it touched the hearts of many. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let's talk about the rehearsals leading up to uh, the recording. I talked to Andy Fairweather Lowe uh, a couple of months ago, and he said that he and Eric came together one week before the band uh, came together in, in Brave Studios, and they laid out like the roadmap for the show. And I was just thinking nowadays, you, when you're in a rehearsal, you just lay down your iPhone, you make a quick recording, and you send it to the rest of the band right. through WhatsApp or WeTransfer or whatever. Uh, but Back in the days, that wasn't possible. <laughs> so, h- how did it go when you all came together and they they had like this idea? How, how did it? Were there sheets or how did the process go? Oops. Oh, excuse me. Excuse Bless me. you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I remember. You know, of course, yeah, no iPhones or anything like that, and and uh, so they were able to get together and sort of go over uh, the roadmaps. Um, Layla. Oh, Excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> well, bless you. Uh, thank you. In Holland, we have a saying, if you sneeze three times tomorrow, it will be better weather. <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah, it's beautiful I, weather here. It's a little chilly, but uh, yeah, just uh, yeah. pardon Over me. here, it's raining cats and dogs. So it, I hope you sneeze one more time and then tomorrow I will have sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, so to have... You know, to walk in and say, "Here's an idea for Layla." That's you know, sort of the slower version. You know, and and uh, yeah. it was all very exciting to 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 kind of be the part of the beginning of innovation. Yeah, and, and the first time they came with that idea, I think because everyone before that time knew that song, like right. it was up tempo and it was like here, uh, and all of a sudden it's like. Bah, bah, bah. We're like, guys, what, what is this? Or did you did you feel it immediately? Yeah, you know, you, it's always nice to do a fresh take on something that you've been playing. And and, uh, and I thought, wow, what a great idea to just completely reimagine this song, you know. And now, yeah. um, you know, there's been a couple times actually that we played both versions in the concert. 
Oh, serious? Yes. Over the years, you know, just, just very, maybe one or two times, but they both ended up in the concert. Ah, I wish you did that last time in, uh, in March when you were in Holland. Yeah. Talking about the rehearsals, um, it was a week, I think, you had. Yes. Yeah. What, so, was that enough? Or was it like, ah, we, we need some extra time? Or uh, No, I think you, you, you get, a, get in there for a week and then you you go over everything and... and At the end of each day, when you go back to your your room or whatever, you have a chance to to uh, sort of uh, go over the music of the day. And so by the time the end of the week came, you know, we we all said, "Hey, ready? You want to go do this?" Yeah. So we spring the invited an audience in in a semicircle and and uh, let's do it. Yeah, because that's also a question I had um, because playing just totally unplugged monitor monitoring wise it's quite a challenge right and i yeah. think especially playing bass you really uh, i know i know uh, acoustic bass it's not that it gives back a lot in a in a in a, in a really loud environment no it's it's um it's kind of one of those things where you're relying on the you know the feel of it to cut through and and then everybody is uh You have such great musicians that are all listening and able to react. Um, you know, so like if you're playing, if you can't hear another instrument, um, that means obviously, you know, it's time to bring your, you know, like especially in the drum category, you know. So yeah. everybody is, was really listening. And, and uh, I think that's another thing that made the, the elements of that very special. And and your backing vocals on, on Unplugged, they are amazing too, because... Uh, I always thought that the yeah, 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 before the solo of Layla was Clapton singing that. But I just recently found out it was you. Oh, man. Yeah. You know yeah. what? You, you just, uh, it comes from the heart, you know. That album is full of like little pieces of, uh, also in the, in the audience, like little cheers and stuff. You, yeah. I know that album so well from back to, to, to forth and and back again it's no i think that would be a fun album to uh to be remixed in atmos as well you know where oh yeah you can have the uh, sounds coming behind you and, uh, uh, do you know that there are plans for for doing that maybe or i don't i haven't heard of any but it, it just occurred to me when you were describing how you hear pick up on different things yeah that um that would be probably a a fun format to hear that record in It would have been a great thing to do last year because last year it was 30 years anniversary. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think they remastered it. Um, yeah. And uh, for for sonically, but but I think yeah, it would be, it would be fun to uh, fun to hear it in Atmos. I think it'd be a, a, a whole another experience. On YouTube, you can find a lot of uh, rehearsal uh, takes, and I really enjoy like looking at those rehearsal tapes because there's like a recording of Layla. Right. It really has just not the vibe of the actual recording. And it's it's like the, the last 10% or the last 5% even, which uh, which a really for playing for a live audience uh, does. You know, that's the thing. Sometimes, even in the rehearsal, sometimes you may even get a better performance. It's, it's always going to be different. Every time you play the same song, it's, there's always going to be a different emotion and, and feeling. And I think that... Uh, Some of those outtakes are, are a lot of fun just to uh, just to compare to once you because you, you have the other one in your in your brain, you know, and how, yeah. how it uh, made you feel. And then all of a sudden you hear you hear a different approach. So that's all for fun. you. Did you did you like play it different every time you, you did a take of a song? We, we did. We did fairly similar, fairly similar arrangements. Um, you know, just it's always going to have a little bit of a variation, but. Um, once you get the, the structure down, you know, we adhere to that. And then within that, it, it varies a little bit. You know, yeah. back in back in the early days of recording, you'd have a lot of, especially on some of the jazz albums where you'd have different takes of the song, you know. So uh, the same song would appear maybe two or three times on on, the, on an album. Yeah, but with a different Yeah, uh, just, you'd, you'd get different solos and different... Uh, yeah different interpretation sometimes, you know, tempo is different and all those little things, uh, you know, make a big difference. Because I think Eric never played it the same twice. No, <laughs> no. Yeah. 
Yeah. But the, the thing is, I'm, I've been playing the whole Unplugged album uh, last fall in, um, in theaters throughout Holland. I cannot play the solo of Leila in any other way than it was recorded. Be <laughs> right. But normally I also improvise everything, but it's so imprinted in my, in my musical memory. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it, those, those become the notes that are like, the, they're almost like the wheel, you know? <laughs> exactly. It's, uh, it's just interesting the way, you know, because for the person recording, it's just, this is what you came up with at, at the one time, you know, they say the most popular uh, air drum fill is the, uh, in the air tonight, Phil Collins, you know, with it. Bah, yeah. bah, 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 and, yeah. and he, you know, he told me, he said, well, if, if I did another take, it would have been something different, you know, but that became <laughs> like the, the, yeah. Yeah. You know, Can you imagine that, you know, you, you always yeah. see 25,000 people in the, <laughs> in the concert doing, doing the same exact film. That's an amazing uh, point of view. I think you have. Yeah, well, the perspective is is fun to see, you know. It's, yeah. And, uh, but yeah, it goes from it goes from a, you know one day of a person in the studio, a guy just come feeling going with his heart, you know. Talking about wonderful musicians, I, I recently found out you played on on Daft Punk's last album, which uh, came out ten years ago. Wow, too much, and it was again so much fun to do, and and when you're. When you're in the studio, you have no way of knowing that something's going to resonate that deeply with the world. You know, I, I you remember. feel like that Get Lucky song was was really a big hit? You know, I, I loved it, but in, and in the studio, one good indication is when everybody's kind of dancing and, and uh, while you're listening to the playback. That's kind of a good in uh, indication that it's a good song, but you never know what's going to, you know, what's going to hit and what's not gonna yeah. take off so uh to see that song again resonate around the world was it was just so much fun i mean i was i was in you know uh, holland germany france driving down and you could hear coming out of the taxis coming out of apartments you know in yeah. japan and uh, you know got back home it was, uh, it was just it was amazing to hear uh hear the song you know just blasting all all over the world a worldwide hit that's something <clears throat> let's get back to the unplugged album uh, the day of the recording uh, what do you remember of that day was what was the vibe like was it relaxed or a bit tense or yeah no the vibe was very relaxed and and chilled you know and the audience was sort of invited guests and family members and friends and you know a lot of people so you you were kind of looking at it you know friends and it was like okay we went from rehearsing this uh all week to uh okay now bring people in to to play it in front of them you know it's always uh you know an exciting field to, to kind of go public with the music yeah. and uh, you know and get those reactions and and it's it, it's fun to listen to because when you listen to the audience you know it's it's like i can hear you know when they were responding for the first time of hearing a song a different way. I mean, it was just, it was just fun to know because everybody's familiar with, with Eric's music, you know, for years and years. So then yeah. when you, when you come out with a different version of Layla or uh, just, uh, you know, introduce the music like that, it's just fun to see the reaction, you know, and, and they were very receptive to it. For me, it was like a starting point, getting to know Eric's music, wow. uh, you know, and then you have yeah. like this whole back catalog to treasure hunt, maybe even. Exactly. You know? Well, and there's there's a lot of gems <laughs> that you can. There find. are a lot of gems. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm still discovering, um, but yeah, for a lot of people, it was <clears throat> for me. It's like Layla, the way it was performed and unplugged. For me, that feels like the the original version. You know. Wow. If you would have to pick uh, one one song, um, a favorite song of of that recording, what what would it be? Well, I Sorry, Nathan, before you answer that question, we have to talk about the sponsor of this podcast, the Fellowship of Acoustics, the best guitar shop in the Netherlands that ships worldwide. And at the Fellowship of Acoustics, you can find premium acoustic guitars, but also electrics, uh, classical guitars, amps, mandolins, banjos, and of course, bass guitars. What do you think of this very nice Bart bass guitar? A custom-built bass built by Robin Bart. Amazing quality. And here you think it, what's in it for me, Struilaert? Well, 
I've got you covered. For you as a listener, I've got a special worldwide discount of 5% on everything in the shop. Just use the code GITAARMANNEN at the checkout. Okay, Nathan, sorry about the interruption. I asked you what your favorite song was, if you had to pick one. I'd have to say Tears in Heaven really just, again, is one of those just songs that just seems to, uh, you know, I remember recording that song. It it played me, you know, I didn't play it, you know. So just of the the emotional attachment to, you know, Connor and, and what the song was about, I think it just makes it a very, to this day, you know, very special song. Yeah, it's a really strong song. I talked to Chuck Lavelle a couple of months ago also great. about the the recording. Yeah, great guy, <laughs> great, great guy. stories he yeah. has to tell. Amazing. Yeah. And he told me about Old Love, uh, that the song uh, wasn't on the official set list, but you had rehearsed it uh, leading right. up to the concert, and that Eric ran out of songs. And <laughs> that was the last one he played. And then, what, what, what do you remember about playing that song? Well, again, it's nice to have, it's nice to have, uh, you know, sort of be over-prepared because in, in that case we're, okay, we need another song. Well, we got Old Love is ready. And uh, again, it's a great uh, song. Uh, I think he and Robert Cray wrote that. And um, I always thought to myself, man, what a, what a very simple but beautiful song, you know, and uh, to play it again, it just, it just, it plays itself. You know, as you're yeah. going through the changes, and then, um, and then one of the all, always when you get to the guitar solo, it's just like buckle up <laughs> because it yeah. just starts. Just it's a beautiful moment. And to think that it wasn't like well rehearsed, like because it wasn't on the set list officially, and this comes out. It's yeah, yeah, and also Chuck with the piano solo. Uh, yeah. Uh, to think that that song almost didn't make the cut. Yeah, you hear a lot of those kind of stories, you know. Uh, Chuck is a wonderful musician and a, and a fantastic, uh, fantastic guy to hang with on the road too. Just so sweet, and uh, as you know from speaking with him. And uh, uh, so again, you know, it, it felt like a family, family affair. That also like adds up to the the the, the value of what what you did, what you guys did at that that moment in time. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it does, uh, you know, it does resonate again with people and the, and, and the stories and the camaraderie is something that I think people gravitate to. You've done a lot of things. You, you played on countless records. You, when, when I look at Wikipedia, I'm like, okay, who, who, who hasn't he played with? <laughs> uh, and on that ladder of all the things that you did, where would you put Unplugged? Oh, man, I, I, I'd put it um, very high up, you know. I mean, in, in the very, very top of the, um, you know, of the list of, of moments and, and favorite things, you know. You know, when, when you're playing, like, Unplugged and, you know, the Easy Lover Project with Philip Bailey, Phil Collins, uh, Daft Punk, these kind of things, you know, they... they they become very special because of the because of the reception that they got, you know. And, and even Prince used to say, you know, you, you you make the music, but then the audience tells you uh, what you know whether it's going to be a success or not, and you have no control over that. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, to be involved with projects that that resonate with the world like that is just a very very special, magical. And uh, how do you? Um think back about the Lady in the Balcony session because that was also recorded at a very special moment in time, like in the midst of the, the, the pandemic still raging throughout Europe and, and the rest of the world. Um, did it come close to the unplugged vibe for you? It, it, it was, I mean, completely different because uh, not there was only one Lady in the Balcony, you know, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. to play with, to play with, uh, you know, literally no, you know, because you know, whether it's 60 people, 200 people, 2,000 or, or uh, 200,000, that always kind of has an effect on, on the energy that you get back, you know. So, you know, by not being able to have uh, an audience because of the lockdown, but to have the audience of Malia Clapton, very special discerning ears, you know, that yeah. <laughs> she knows the songs better than anybody, uh, it made it very special, and, and I, I enjoyed every minute of that project. You know? 
It was a crazy time. I'm I'm very happy that that we c could leave it behind us. Uh, for yeah. Now. Oh, me too. Yeah. yeah. It was uh, when when that happened. All the touring got shut down, and you know, literally, I had a completely booked summer. And then everything just started to, be, oh, nope, we're not going to go, oh, cancel, Nothing. cancel, cancel, you know, so it was uh, how did you How did you make it through that period? What, what did you do? Well, I, first of all, it was, a, it was a golden opportunity to be home with my family, you know, it's something that I never would have had, uh, hmm. had all the touring continued. So uh, to be able to get that close to my family and kids and, and wife was, to me, a, a blessing. You know, so I, I enjoyed every minute and the, just to do things around the house that I, I don't have time to do normally. And yeah. uh, to stop, smell the coffee, to stop and uh, be able to, you know, enjoy uh, breakfast, lunch and dinner with my family. There's, for me, that was, I thought this was a gift, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, uh, and are, you, uh, are you glad that it's back to normal or do you miss? Because I hear that sometimes now from other musicians, they miss a little bit the, the rest that we had during the lockdowns. Yeah, you know, um, because then now once it, once it cranked back up, you know, I, I, like I haven't really stopped this year and the, like I haven't really even had a chance to, to just take a breath. You know, there's just so many things going on and, and you're always preparing for the next and, and which is sort of why we signed up for, <laughs> for being yeah. musicians. That's what we signed up for. But there's a, a there's a balance that I think uh, that we need to have, and and I think what that situation did is is gave us a, a very clear view of how to try to maintain that balance. And, uh, yeah, it gave us some some insight we otherwise wouldn't have yeah, had. Yeah, yeah. So it also did a lot of things. Uh, Eric himself was a little bit like in the center of like this outrage. How, how did you look at that? Yeah, I, I looked at that as as a. Uh, as a head scratcher, I didn't know, like, why all of a sudden are we, you know, is, is this a, such a divisive kind of energy going into yeah. something that I thought was, you know, and, and every person, um, you know, has an opportunity to make whatever choice they want about whatever they want to do, you know? And, uh, so I thought there were so many people chiming in and, and, uh, next thing you know, it's like you, you put one item here in the middle of the room, and then you have people from all sides telling you, you know, why they like or why they don't like. It's almost like, you know, and that's why I love music because it's a song. You know, you get there and okay, oh, I like this song. Oh, I like this song better, or whatever. But yeah, but it, it doesn't have the uh, the political attachment that that for whatever reason this had. Everything is so political nowadays. Right. <laughs> yeah. Let's get back to the music. Yeah, I think I think bring back the music and and uh, you know the, the the politics. You know they can occupy a, a space of their own, but the music is 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 a very special gift. You know. Yeah. And uh, very special language that that I think we all um, appreciate even more now. Yeah. Talking about music um, and family, your son. Uh, he will be in Holland <laughs> at the end of this month, touring with his uh, his band, The Cream of Clapton. Uh, I, I will put the dates on on the screen now in in the, in the edit, okay. uh, so people can see where where uh, they can check him. But can you tell me something about his project? Yes, and and, and it's it's very exciting for uh, for me as a father to to see him. You know, and this is is basically his first tour, and and they're uh, having some great shows so far. But to have to have sort of the family connection with this music that he's had, you know, since he grew up and, um, and, and to see him now being able to play the music is just very, very exciting. And I think they're doing well. I, I, I know different versions of the band, you know, Ginger Baker's son, uh, Kofi Baker was part of the band at, for a while. And, uh, Glenn Johns, uh, who's Eric's nephew, I mean, Glenn Johns, Will Johns. <laughs> Will Johns, yeah. I just like saw a name. video with Glenn. He was a wonderful <laughs> yeah, producer. Yeah. Uh, but Will Johns, you know, in the great talent, uh, guitarist, singer, and it's very, uh, it's, it's very sweet to see them paying tribute to this music and Eric. But they're not like uh, reenacting the songs. They're playing it <clears throat> with their own vibe, right? That's exactly. the thing of it. Yeah, and... Uh, 
As a matter of fact, you know, we better watch out because they're 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 bringing some nice, <laughs> nice new flavor to the songs, and they're they're doing all the all the classics, you know. So definitely, people go out and watch uh, the Cream of Clapton here in and Hollywood. And they have, I think, they put the, the dates up on the the Cream of Clapton Band Facebook page too. Ah, to end the podcast, uh, do you have a tip for all the musicians, uh, young and old, um, to like? improve their playing or even when they're stuck? Well, one of the things that I always say is just um, do as much listening as possible. And and for me, I still enjoy, uh, you know, listening to all different genres of music, uh, whether it's classical, hip hop, rock and roll, R&B, jazz, you know, country, western, you know, I mean, I enjoy it all. And and go, go you know, go back, go forward and, and um, it just gives you sort of a, a, a wider frame of reference, you know, as you're making music, you know, to, to think, you know, oh, wonder what Stevie would have done here, you know, or, or, or you know, just borrowing from the, the favorites that, you know, and, and just now with, with YouTube and Spotify and, and all these places where you can access music, um, I think it's just fun to explore and, and and go as deep as you can into the music. So just so that you get it inside of you, uh, which makes, you know, then what you create and give back, it, it just has an effect on that as well. Yeah. Great, great lesson. Thank you very much. Right. And also this conversation really inspired me. So I'd I would like to thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure. And uh, thanks for, uh, thanks for your support. And then for, uh, you know, even, even putting these kind of things together, I think it helps, uh, further what we all do. We, uh, we have to keep telling the story and- uh, No, thank you, absolutely, you know, and uh, I, I think music makes the world go round. It's one of the, my go-to places when things get too crazy, you can always go there and uh, uh, the music will never let you down. That's a great, great line to end the podcast with. <laughs> okay, cheers, it's all the best. Okay. Like, perfect time and my wife is just giving me a call right now. <laughs> ah, that's great. <laughs> Say hi to your wife. Thank okay, you very much. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks for watching. If you like the podcast, please hit that like button and subscribe for more guitar related content. And if you would like to see the other interviews I had with Andy Fairweather Low and Chuck Lavelle, all about the Unplugged album, please click on this playlist. Also, it would mean the world to me if you would check out my own music. You can do so by clicking right here. Thank you very much. See you later.